There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode 14 of the Shine On Podcast, I'm Evan Shine. As always, producer David Yaz is with us. David, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Good to be back in the Shine On virtual studios. Dave, I got to tell you, we've been absolutely fantastic show today. I am joined by Broadway and television actress Jessica Phillips. You have seen her on the Broadway stage and on TV, most recently starring in the hit Broadway show, Dear Evan Hansen, where Jessica plays the incredibly important role of mom, Heidi Hansen. On March 12th, 2020, Broadway's lights in the Big Apple went dark. The entertainment and performing arts industry like so many industries and sectors, were decimated and crushed by the pandemic. So many people from actors and actresses to the -the behind-the-scenes workers and all the wonderful and great people who are responsible for bringing us the productions and entertainment that we love, we cherish, and we enjoy were unemployed and out of work. Upcoming projects were put on hold. The dreams of young stars and directors and writers and also veterans of the entertainment industries who had made a comeback were suddenly dashed. Over one year later, while the lights in Times Square are still dark, there's optimism about the return of Broadway and people and families. They're craving the joy and the happiness and the togetherness that the performing arts industry brings us, especially right now. We're going to talk to our featured guest, Jessica Phillips, about the state of the performing arts industry, a look ahead to the return of Broadway the impact and importance of entertainment and Broadway on relationships and families. We're also going to talk to Jessica about the lessons that she learned from her own divorce and the positive impact of what she learned on her career, parenting, and her journey to find love again. Coming up on the other side of the docky is my interview with our featured guest this week on episode number 14 of the Shine On podcast, actress Jessica Phillips. This is an interview that you will not want to miss. All right, Evan, once again, time for the docket. Should I fire it up, sir? Dave, let's do it. All right. And now, let's see what's on the docket. Well, from the world of hip-hop comes news about Dr. Dre's, Dr. Dre and a court case, and the headline In uh, page six of the New York Post, judge rules Dr. Dre must find a new lawyer in the Nicole Young divorce case. Dr. Dre has to get a new lawyer. A judge has ruled that powered divorce attorney Laura Wasser and Dr. Dre's lawyer Howard King cannot represent him in his blockbuster split from estranged wife Nicole Young. Wasser is known as one of L.A.'s biggest divorce attorneys, repping clients including Kim Kardashian, but Young and her attorney argued in court papers that King had previously represented Dre and Young throughout their marriage. Wasser was vicariously disqualified from repping the rap mogul because she was working with King. So, disqualification for Dre. And what do you think? What Does this happen a lot, Evan? And tell us your thoughts on the, the Dre case. Dave, I'll tell you what. In an absolutely fascinating development in Dr. Dre's divorce, like you said, his divorce attorney has apparently been removed from the case. Reports are that Laura Wasser is no longer representing Dr. Dre pursuant to court order. And this happens. And this brings up a really important legal issue, the disqualification of counsel. Look, I've encountered this in my practice. And I'll tell you what, whether or not you decide to file a motion seeking the disqualification of counsel, this is all about timing and strategy. And from the look of it, it apparently worked out for Samantha Spector, Nicole Young's attorney. But I'll tell you one thing, if you're going to make a motion seeking the disqualification of the other side and the other attorney, the odds better be pretty good that you will win or you're stuck dealing with an adversary who you tried to have removed. (laughs) And good luck getting any cooperation from that attorney going forward. And look, I can't speak to the standard, Dave, in California, 
But the general rule in New York is a party seeking to disqualify his or her adversary's attorney on the basis of having been previously represented by that counsel, you must establish that there was an attorney-client relationship between the other party and the attorney, that the matters involved in both representations are substantially related, and that the interest of the present client and former client are materially adverse. And so that's the general rule in New York. And I'm guessing that California is similar in the way it's approached. Mm -hmm. What well, does that mean? And, and sorry if I didn't follow that fully, but as does that mean as a matter of thumb, if you represented someone in a divorce and then later on you're sought to be, see, I, I don't think it would come up that often what, where, where the divorcing spouse is now looking to hire you. Why would they want to hire their soon to be ex's former lawyer, I guess. Well, but, well I'll give an example. Yeah. If, okay. if, if someone represents a family, or husband and wife in connection okay. with estate planning or in connection with the purchase of an apartment. And then that same attorney represents or tries to represent one of them in the divorce in connection right. with the divorce. That attorney had previously been involved in a matter where he or she was privy to certain information, certain disclosures that would make the representation of one in an adversarial proceeding in a divorce it would bring up lots of questions. Next on the docket comes a story about a new mental wellness show. The story from the Columbia Chronicle reads, after he suffered a concussion from falling in the shower and subsequently watched the documentary about Mr. Rogers, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Tim Bearden decided to create a mental wellness show for kids called Let Me Be Your Helper. He says there's a phrase out there that says, who does it worse does it first, said Bearden. I disagree with that in the case of Mr. Rogers, but I agree with the sentiment that we can build on what Mr. Rogers has already established for us and bring that awareness to the next generation. So you flagged this article, Evan, shrewdly, because I, I think the impact on kids on a show like this can be potentially powerful. I know I watched Mr. Rogers as a kid, and that documentary was, was just inspiring. That was like, even I needed tissues for that one. But your thoughts on this new one? Dave, we're on the same page. It was inspiring. And, and look, this is a really important article. And with everything going on in the world and the impact of COVID and the pandemic on children and their mental health, and we talk about the impact of the pandemic on mental health, adults, kids, with our featured guests this week. But I love seeing this. I love seeing the intention and focus placed on children and mental health. Now, the article notes that Bearden is divorced and has a seven-year-old son. The article mentions how after the divorce, his son was affected and Bearden took him to play therapy, which helped to teach his son to better communicate, express feelings, and develop problem-solving skills. And the title and the name, Let Me Be Your Helper, I love it. Mm. I think it's brilliant and it really resonates with me on so many levels. And as a divorce attorney, and I work with clients who are going through divorce and, and custody is an issue. And, you know, mental health is a big focus of what I do. And so when I see something like this in the work that Bearden's doing, I absolutely love it. And look, the focus is mental health. And it's not solely in the divorce context. It's mental health across the board. Yeah. One of the things that struck me about the Mr. Rogers documentary is he never wavered from being positive, you know, and he apparently single-handedly saved public television in, in one congressional hearing. And, you know, he was nerdy. He was the kind of guy that would lent himself to parody. But there was no dark side to Mr. <laughs> Rogers. I mean, or if, there, no, it's true. Or, if right. there, or if there was, he just, he kept it from us. And he just, you know, there's, there's something to that. And this guy seems to have the the similar inspiration. So I, I agree with you. I think it's great. We, we could use a new Mr. Rogers, you know, he's, he's missed. No, you're absolutely right, Dave. Our featured guest this week on the Shine On Podcast is actress and Broadway star Jessica Phillips. You have seen her on the Broadway stage and on TV, most recently starring in the hit Broadway show, Dear Evan Hansen, where Jessica played the incredibly important role of mom, Heidi Hansen. Before joining the cast in New York City, Jessica starred in the national tour of Dear Evan Hansen, 
Her impressive Broadway career includes The Scarlet Pimpernel, Next to Normal, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and Leap of Faith. She has appeared on TV, on Law and Order, SVU, and several other television shows. Jessica, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me, Evan. Of course. And Jessica, there's so much I want to get into and talk about with you. And we're inching close to being on the other side of the pandemic and a return to Broadway. But before I do, I want to go back to March and April of 2020. Can you describe the moment for you with everything going on in the world when you heard that Broadway was going dark and there was no timetable for the return? Yeah. Well, you know, obviously we were all aware of the news and we saw this ramping up. And so there was some, I think, some general understanding that it was going to impact us by shutting us down for a while. But, you know, the, the first time we heard about this from management, it was fairly short term. You know, people were saying, well, maybe a couple of weeks maybe 30 days. And, you know, for an industry that has really never shut down, save for three days after 9-11, you know, there was just no way to kind of wrap our brains around what that meant. So we went in on a Wednesday. I went on a Wednesday, did two shows, and then woke up Thursday morning to the, the news from the governor that, that we were shut down. And then, of course, you know, we had, we had correspondence with our producer who talked to us about, you know, how unprecedented this was and how we just sort of needed to hang on. But at that point, we didn't know that it was indefinite. You know, at that point, we thought, okay, well, we're shut for 30 days and we'll figure it out. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a scary time for everybody. So we were sort of along for the ride. But for our industry in particular, it was, completely unprecedented. Last year, there was article after article that came out about really the impact of COVID and the pandemic on the entertainment and performing arts industry and how many people were affected. And, you know, you heard story after story about the young up and coming director or writer or actor or actress or someone in costume or, or wardrobe who lost their job and who was affected. And you hear story after story about that. What have you heard from the people you work with on the production, Dear Evan Hansen, and really your friends and and workers in the industry as to how everybody's coping and getting through this difficult time? It's been fairly grim, to be honest. I mean, artists are gig workers. So we're used to our jobs ending or losing our jobs when a show closes, but we're also used to getting back out there and hustling and auditioning and you know, promoting ourselves and trying to get that, that next gig. And obviously that just wasn't possible here. So all of us in the entertainment industry really kind of had to pivot to figure out how to support we had to figure out how to support ourselves outside of this industry. And, you know, that was harder for some people than others. Certainly many of us have skill sets outside sure. of what we do that allow us, you know, to teach or to pick up some other kind of income producing job. But that was very difficult. And I think probably the, the largest impact it had was on mental health because many of us, Many artists lost not just their income, but their whole professional identity. And, you know, I mean, artists become artists in the first place because we have a capacity to connect emotionally and to bring that experience to life in some way on a canvas or in a book or in a piece of music or on stage. And so the impact of losing our jobs and our entire industry, the prospect of another job was crushing, I think, for many of us from um, a psychological standpoint. And so it really led to, you know, a period of deep mourning and grief for artists in general who have, who were searching to, to live out uh, their, you know, creative expression and their entire professional identity. Just keep- I want to piggyback off something you said. You said pivot in the industry, and I want to get to that. But I I want to go off of the mental health aspect, something you bring up, which is incredibly important. And I think the pandemic in the past year, look, 
the pandemic's affected everyone, whether you're an adult, whether you're a kid. And I want to ask you about Dear Evan Hansen, because it's such an incredible and powerful show about social anxiety, about suicide. And there's so many great takeaways from the show. And your role as Heidi Hansen is so incredibly powerful. And it registers with so many parents and mothers and children. You mentioned the focus on mental health and something everybody's going through, adults and children. With everything going on, how do you view your character, your role, and really the importance and incredible awareness that a production like Dear Evan Hansen brings to this topic? You know, for me personally, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't, I didn't have to to reach very far to connect with the character. And I think it's because it's written so beautifully. The piece is written beautifully, but my particular character is constructed so effectively that there's there's something for everyone to identify with when they come see the show. And I think for many parents, something to identify with specifically in in my character. I mean, my particular character is a single mom who's gone through a divorce and is raising this teenage boy. And, you know, that mirrors my life. I'm not single now, but I I was single for many years raising my, my two boys. And so I was able to, to connect that personal experience to this character. And I feel like, I mean, the feedback that I get from parents who have come to see the show and specifically from moms who flag me at the stage door are saying, you know, you told my story up there. I saw myself in you. And even though, you know, I am remarried or even though I have a daughter, you know, even though there are these differences to this specific story, the the feeling that you brought to the struggles that you have with parenting in as a whole are are feelings that I have all the time and you normalize them for me by you know by bringing this character to life and that is what I love most about my job is the ability to allow people to have a, a personal experience when they sit in the theater and they allow this this story to be brought to life for them. And I would imagine when you tell that story, that's so powerful and that it has to be such a wonderful feeling for you when you hear those stories from so many mothers and so many parents who you speak with. Jessica, I want to ask you, and you mentioned your own divorce, and I want to talk to you about your acting career and balancing the challenges with your career from a scheduling standpoint and you know the demands of being an actress and being on Broadway with parenting post-divorce? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's tough for everyone. It's tough for people who have, a, you know, a sort of traditional schedule, but I have a really atypical schedule. I, when I'm on Broadway, I work in the evenings and, and I travel a lot. I go to where the work is, which is sometimes on the other coast and, you know, sometimes in kind of uh, random locations. And so it took a lot of creative thinking for me as I came through my divorce and and, and into the other side where I was parenting alone or parallel parenting with my ex. It took a lot of creative thinking to be able to, you know, find a way to have all of the quality time that I once did with my boys when, when we were together but to work around my particular schedule. And, you know, I had to do a lot of, I I needed a team, of course. I needed a a legal team and I needed a a counseling team for mental health purposes. And, you know, I needed a lot of support from my family and friends and logistical support, of course. But I, I think that it was most challenging for me to remind myself that it it didn't need to be traditional in order to be good for my children, that I could still go take a job where I was going to be out of town for three months. And I could fly them to me on a couple of weekends and have quality time with them. Or I could trade off with their dad on, you know, months in the summer or some longer chunks of time. And that in the end, what was important was that I was spending good quality, important time together with them. And the time that I wasn't with them, 
I was taking care of myself and I was taking care of them financially. And it's about, for me, it was about finding real balance between those things, even though logistically it was very tricky. And in in my case, very tricky because I, you know, I had fairly high conflict divorce. And so we don't, we didn't, and still don't co-parent well together, but even with those challenges and, and dealing with a sort of non-traditional schedule with a lot of support and a lot of creative thinking and a lot of intention, I was able to carve out, I have been able to carve out, you know, some really important periods of time with my kids, even when I'm working. And Jessica, you mentioned the high conflict nature, and, and you also mentioned having the team of different professionals surrounding you through the process and as you navigate, you know, post-divorce life. How important is it to have a team of people, all the people, you know, you mentioned, friends, family, a legal team, mental health team, how important is it to have a team and to feel supported, not only when you're going through the divorce process, but post-divorce? I think it's incredibly important, and I would refer your listeners to another one of your podcasts where you, you know, talked with the divorce doctor. I, I just thought that, that she was so incredibly helpful and you know, informative, and I just echo everything that she said. I'm, I'm no expert, of course, but in my own experience, I mean, I couldn't have done it another way. I mean, I really relied on the emotional and logistical support of the people around me who cared about me to make it through because, you know, divorce is just an incredibly stressful time and relearning how to do everything in your life with while, you know, with only one set of hands, of course, if you're a parent, and also doing that while grieving and mourning in the changes in your life and, and your own losses is, it's just incredibly depleting. And so, you know, it it was for me really vital to surround myself with with people who, you know, could just kind of pull up in the middle of the night and help if I needed an extra hand or, you know, listen, pick up the phone and take my call if I needed to talk about something. And, you know, in terms of like the professionals in my life, I could not, I mean, I really needed to sort of hand over all of the complex legal stuff to my legal team and, and then take all of the very complex emotional stuff into the therapist's office and try to sort through it. And Jessica, when you think back to right after you were divorced and that process, and then fast forward to where you are now, career, parenting, new relationships, how would you compare and contrast that time in your life right after you were divorced and where you are right now? When I think back on the immediate post-divorce time, I just, the, the feeling that is most prevalent is just the sense of being out of my body. You know, I just sort of everything didn't quite look exactly right and didn't feel exactly real or normal or, or good. And, you know, what's happened in those eight or nine years has really grounded me. You know, I've been able to continue to work on my own mental health and understand better how my own, you know, my own issues, my own junk that we, you know, that we all have <laughs> sure, and that we sure. all bring into relationships, how that could best be addressed and how I could separate myself from the experience, the traumatic experience of the divorce and and find a way to look at it as an incredibly growthful experience so that you know i was able to kind of turn away from this idea like why is this happening to me and toward the idea of like why is this happening for me you know what is this giving me in terms of information about who i am and what i want and what i have to offer in a new relationship and what I have to offer to my work, you know, because I think as these things go, everything is connected. The more solid I am in terms of who I am outside of that experience, the more I'm able to be fully present in my life. And that means I'm able to bring much, much more material to my work 
I'm able to be better at my job and I'm able to, to be there for the people I love and I'm able to be the best parent I can be. Jessica, you mentioned the divorce doctor who was a recent guest on the Shine On podcast and something I've talked with Dr. Elizabeth Cohen about was, was the importance of self-care and how divorce can be a very positive experience as someone goes forward in life and as someone heals and processes the divorce. And you mentioned several different things, you know, positives and lessons learned about yourself, about your relationships, about, you know, your own well-being that makes you better at your career, makes you focusing on parenting. And I want to ask you about finding love and getting into a new relationship. And you mentioned it's been a handful of years since your separation and since you're divorced and you're remarried. And so I want to ask you about finding love again, getting into a new relationship. And what was that process and journey like for you? I think, you know, for, for me, it was about measuring my, my fear about getting back into another relationship because, you know, because my divorce was so high conflict and because it was a traumatic experience for me, I think, you know, there's a part of me that thought, well, this is all bad and I'm never going to do that again. I can't trust anybody. But obviously, you know, those were just immediate protective responses. And I mean, for me, I, you know, I ended up, I, I, I ended up getting into a relationship with someone that I was just friends with who was also going through a high conflict divorce. <laughs> So we sort of surprised each other by, you know, not, I don't think either of us were, were prepared or looking for a relationship. It just kind of fell in our laps because we had these parallel experiences and we were able to really understand each other and that part of our lives. And I think it was helpful in terms of taking next steps and, you know, sort of sidestepping my fear about getting back. In, into the into another relationship, so you know, I, and I think that's probably true across the board in terms of understanding yourself and your own your own needs and your own fears, and that you know, one big benefit of coming through a divorce or any anything that feels like it kind of pulls your life apart is that when you step into another relationship. I think you're able to bring that experience with you and hopefully make choices that reflect that experience. You know, when I married my second husband, you know, we were very careful about and very intentional about saying, you know, here are the, here are our boundaries and here are our expectations and we sort of took out the fantasy part of what it means to be swept off your feet. And said, like, no, we're making a decision now to become partners. And along with that decision comes a lot of, you know, deliberate decision making about how we handle our finances and how we handle our uh, children and how, you know, how we are involved in each other's careers and lives. And that was a real gift to be able to kind of walk into my next relationship with my eyes open and bring the lessons that I learned from the first experience with me. Jessica, you mentioned, you know, the lessons that you learned from your first experience to everyone listening out there who is struggling with believing that they can find love again or struggling to, to get through that day or the process. What are the lessons that you learned that have helped you in the past several years in going forward? It's really, uh, for me, it comes down to, self-examination and recognizing what I bring, what I personally bring into relationships with everyone in my life. You know, the lessons for me were about, you know, how I can address my own, you know, personal baggage and, and also recognizing what gifts I, I bring to, to a partnership, what strengths I bring to a partnership and being able to have a better, I guess, to be able to step outside of myself some and be able to assess that. that that's probably the biggest lesson I, I've learned in coming through all of this and the work that I've done since my divorce and up to the last couple of years. And I would think that that lesson, what you just said, what you've learned, it's helped you across the board 
in your approach to your career, in your new relationship, in your interactions with family, friends, and parenting as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Here's the thing, we don't, what, there's not a single human being on the planet that doesn't have their own kind of set of complex junk. You know, we sure. all, we all have our own experiences from, you know, from our childhood and we have our, we have our, our own particular strengths and weaknesses. And so it's not about finding anything that's going to fix you or complete you. In my opinion, you know, it's just about understanding who you are and how to navigate those particular, navigate in a particular way through, through your life, through relationships and, and through your work relationships and what you bring specifically to, you know, to your professional life. And Jessica, you mentioned earlier your approach to playing the role of Heidi Hansen on Dear Evan Hansen and how you bring your personal life experiences to that role. So I want to ask you about when you're on stage, whether it's in Dear Evan Hansen or on TV, how do you approach, what's your mindset when you bring in terms of in character, taking your own experiences and taking that to the stage? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a great question because every actor's process is slightly different when it comes to bringing personal information to the role. It's my job to create a a fully fledged human being when I bring a character to life, whether that's on stage or on television and, or through a voice, you know, and I think that, you know, it depends on that particular character. It depends on the, the, the context of the role within the piece. But I think for me, it's the the creative process allows me to say, how is this character vulnerable? And in what ways can I relate to that? And how is this character, you know, particularly gifted or obtuse? And what can I identify there that I can bring to it? And in the end, it's my job to, to say the words that are written or sing the songs that have been composed, but to do that with, you know, with my own sort of particular level of intimacy. And, and so for Heidi Hansen, you know, as I said, I really, I personally really relate to the, you know, the single mom struggle and the raising of teenage boy struggle and the, the desire to, you know, Heidi really wants to connect with her son and, and struggles with that. And, you know, I think that is a fairly universal feeling for parents of teenage uh, children, that they don't always know how to, to find a common language. And so, you know, what you see in our play is, this particular parent sort of weaving in and out of different ways that she's attempting to connect with her son. And sometimes it's over the top and sometimes it's not enough. And, you know, and she embarrasses him. And, and, and these are all, I think, fairly universal. And so, you know, what's great for me is that I can identify with those things. And then as I bring them to life, the audience can identify with those things. And we all sort of have a shared experience in that room. And that, I think, is the beauty of a piece of live theater. Jessica, you mentioned, you know, the beauty of, of live theater. And I want to ask you about the importance and impact of entertainment and Broadway on family and relationships. And I think given everything that's going on in the world, people are craving being together. People want to be back in the theater, people want to be back in person with their families, friends, loved ones, enjoying those experiences. What is the impact of Broadway, of the performing arts on families and relationships? Well, I, I, you know, we, I think we rely on the arts to express externally what we are experiencing internally, right? We want to turn on friends and watch these people relate to each other because, you know, we long to have friendships like that. And, 
you know, we want to turn on an Adam Sandler movie and watch him, you know, embarrass himself <laughs> because, sure. you know, internally we have these experiences and we want to see them, we want to see them reflected back to us, other people living those things out so that we don't feel alone, so that we feel seen, so that we feel commonality, so that we can connect. And that I think, you know, whether it's a film or a television show or a piece of live theater, you know, that's the value of what the arts bring to our community. And I think, yeah, you know, this, this, this year of being behind our computer screens and, you know, shuttered in our homes and unable to connect has had, you know, has had a, an, an impact on everyone's mental health. And I think people's longing to, to, to not only to see and be with other people and connect on a more, you know, connect physically, connect emotionally, but also to see the year kind of play out in front of us as reflected back in more, you know, creative situations. So I, I think that what we're going to, I'm hoping that what we're going to find as we come out of this, this quarantine year is that A, we're going to have a lot of rich, diverse, new pieces of art that have been made in this, you know, sort of wintering of our uh, industry. And I think I'm hoping that we also have, you know, sort of roaring 20s rush to participate in that people are going to want to go to concerts and feel that music live, you know, they're going to want to go to museums and actually stand in front of, of paintings and allow themselves to have an emotional experience. And of course, Broadway is hoping that people just cannot wait to get into a Broadway house and be able to watch people tell stories in front of them, not behind the screen, and be able to feel the sort of communal exhale and common experience that happens when you are in a room like that. Jessica, it's, it's so well said and so important because I think the entertainment industry, like all industries, had to pivot. And live performances were now brought to the audiences and listeners through Zoom and, and live performances became virtual performances. But I think so much of that is in person. And I can speak for myself, but I can't wait to be back in person, you know, in a courtroom. My court appearances are taking place virtually. But I think that goes for all industries, which I, especially in the performing arts, the connection and you hit on it, being in person in a Broadway house or, you know, at a music venue is so incredibly important for people to feel it, to see it, to breathe it in person. I think that connection is so vital and so important for people. And I know I'm looking forward to the return of that. And so Jessica, as we finish up on the Shine On podcast, I want to ask you how you've spent the past year and what's next for you, Broadway, TV? What projects are you working on? Yeah, I just, uh, I just returned from six months in LA where I was shooting a television show called Why Women Kill. And that will stream on Paramount+. Plus. And so I, I mean, I just consider myself very lucky to be one of the very few working actors during this, this quarantine period. And so, I, so that's what I did for the last six months. And that was very interesting. I mean, a, a, a television show shot in a studio is a fairly contained environment. And so that part of the industry was able to rally fairly quickly and say, okay, let's put these protocols in place. You know, I was tested three times a week and everybody had all the PPE on and, you know, we had really strict rules around uh, how many minutes we could be shooting in front of the camera without our masks on. And, and in the end, you know, it costs, but I think I, I think the show cost twenty or twenty five percent more to shoot because of all these protocols than it normally does. And so, you know, everyone's sort of doing this at a bit of a loss, but financial loss, but the desire for content is is so <laughs> great, new content. And so, you know, I'm I'm really proud that that we have that part of the industry has figured out, you know, how, sort of how to get back on our feet and and make some new shows. So that, I don't know when that is going to start streaming, but probably this, this summer at some point. Great. I, I'm, and, intrigued, I'm intrigued by the name. I can't wait to, I can't wait yeah. to see it. Yeah. Well, I, it, uh, don't worry. I don't need a lawyer. 
<laughs> it is all pretend, but yeah, I think it's, I think it should be really fun. And it was a great departure for me to, you know, to do that kind of a, a television production after having been on the road for a year and then on Broadway up until when we were shuttered. But in the meantime, I'm going to be looking, auditioning and looking for other jobs. Just got to tell you, this was absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you for coming on the Shine On podcast. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was so fun for me. Thanks for having me, Evan. Episode 14 of the Shine On podcast in the books. How great was Jessica Phillips? I got to tell you, Dave, such a great interview and spot with her. Listening to her talk about the return to Broadway and the impact of COVID on the Broadway and entertainment and performing arts industry. Look, it gave me chills. It was great talking to Jessica about the impact of Broadway on family and relationships, as well as, you know, everything she went through in her own divorce and the lessons that she learned. Thank you to the listeners on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Producer, David Yes, thank you as always. My pleasure, my friend. This podcast reminded me that your promise to take me to a Broadway show if I ever show up in New York. Now, you never promised that, but... What do you say? Dave, my pleasure. Would love it. Okay. <laughs> to, to all the listeners, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Clubhouse. Send your emails into the Shine on Podcast email address, Evan at shineandivorce.com. Listen to all the podcasts at my website, shineandivorce.com. Follow, listen, subscribe, and shine on. I'm Evan Shine. We'll talk to you again real soon. <laughs>